Right, thank you, good morning. Um, so, quick show of hands. So, who here has heard of Azul? Ah, okay, so, so probably about half the audience and half the audience hasn't. Okay, so I'll, I'll kind of talk a little bit more about what we do at the end, but we're basically a company that does nothing but Java runtimes. So, we're heavily involved in the whole idea of JDKs, JVMs, and all that sort of thing. So in this presentation, we're going to talk about what's happening in terms of the development of the Java language. And specifically, we're going to look at type patterns in Java. So let's talk about pattern matching in Java. We have this wonderful API, java.util.regex. And in that, we will find that there is pattern matching. We have the pattern class. We can compile a pattern using a regular expression. We can then match against a particular string, and we can determine whether we actually match that string. OK. And then we could do it in one line. That's not what we're here to talk about today. So anybody who's thinking they're going to learn about regular expressions and pattern matching like that, no. That is not what we are here to talk about. Let's talk about patterns in terms of a programming language. This is not a new concept. This is something that's been around really since the beginning of programming languages. You can go all the way back to the 1960s and look at languages like Haskell and Orc. Anybody here used Orc? A few old timers there. That's good to see. One of my favorite languages is Orc. Great tool for when you're doing command line type things. What do we mean by a pattern? Well, a pattern consists of, in this case, two things. We have what's called a match predicate. And essentially, what we're doing there is we're looking to see whether our pattern matches a given target. And we're going to see lots of examples of this as we go through. So really, it's a conditional. It's a, a test to see whether we can match against something. And then associated with that, we have zero or more pattern variables. And the pattern variables are going to be conditionally extracted based on whether our pattern matches against the target. So it's quite simple, quite straightforward. And as we'll see as we go through, we can use this in a number of different ways to enhance the language that we have in terms of Java. There are a variety of pattern types. The most basic of those is a constant pattern type. Essentially, what we're doing is matching on a constant. Now, in this case, if you'll excuse the pun, in this case, we already use that in the switch statement. So when you have a case one, case two, that is a constant pattern. You're looking for the value one, you're looking for the value two. Great. Now, in that case, you don't have pattern variables because it's a constant. When it gets more interesting is when you have things like type patterns. And there, you're matching on a type in terms of the programming language, whether it's a string, whether it's a float, whether it's a color, or whatever. But then you can take things further. And you can have what's called a deconstruction pattern. In this case, we're going to match against a particular thing. But then we're also going to do some additional extraction of values from what we're matching against our target. Again, we'll see examples of this as we go through. We have a var pattern, which is where we're going to use type inference to map to a specific type pattern. Again, I'll show you examples of that later on. And the last one we're going to talk about today is the any pattern. In this case, it's an underscore. So here we're going to match against anything, but we actually don't care what we're matching against. So we're not going to bind to anything in terms of pattern variables. Now, it might seem like a, a sort of an odd thing to say. Well, we're going to match against something, but we don't care what it is, and we're not going to use it. Why we do that will become apparent later on. OK, before we get into the pattern matching side of things, we need to look at two specific features that have been added to Java over the last few years in terms of our six-month release cadence. The reason we're going to do that is because they're very important when it comes to talking about how pattern matching actually works. 
First of those is switch expressions. Now, if you look at Java the language, we've had the switch statement right from the very beginning. Java is heavily based, as I'm sure you know, on the syntax of the C programming language. That was deliberate to make it easier for people who had learned C to translate and transition to using Java. And one of those things was using the switch statement. Now, I'm sure that lots of you here have used that, and you've found that there are a number of places where the way switch works can be somewhat error prone. For example, you have a set of case statements, and then you do something associated with those case statements. But you must remember to put a break statement after those. Otherwise, the way the case is designed to work, the switch is designed to work, it will drop through to the next set of case statements. Hands up, who here has ever forgotten to put a break in? Yeah, yeah exactly. We've all done it. I know I've done it multiple times. And it's infuriating, isn't it? Because you, you look at the code and you go, I just don't see how it can possibly do that. And then you look and you go, ah, oh, I forgot to put the break in. And it's dropped through into the next set of cases. Yeah, now obviously, you know, our IDEs are getting better and they can, they can find things like that more easily. But that is a problem. Also, some of the scoping around local variables is sometimes not quite as intuitive. Let's look at a very typical way that we use the switch statement at the moment. What we're doing here is we're switching on one value the day of the week, and then we want to assign a value to another variable, in this case, number of letters. So simple idea. We're going to go through and look at the day and say, in the case of Monday, Friday, and Sunday, number of letters is 6, case of Tuesday, it's 7, and so on. Now again, this has error-prone constructs to it. If we use a local variable, we can have the situation where if we forget to assign a value to number of, de number of letters, then the compiler will catch that because we need definite assignment of a local variable. But if we use an instance field that has a default value, if we forget to assign a value to number of letters, then again, we get these hard to find bugs because suddenly it's going to be zero and we're expecting it to be something other than that. So what they did in terms of designing the, the Java languages, they said, okay, let's introduce a new idea. Let's introduce the idea of a switch expression. Now, a statement is where you execute a number of instructions, but you don't generate a result. An expression is where you execute a number of instructions and you do generate a result. That result can then be assigned to a variable. If we look at this piece of code here, what we've got is the same switch that we had on the previous slide, but now it's much more concise and it's much more reliable in terms of the code. What we see here is that obviously we've got the switch as an expression. So we're generating a result from that and we can make the assignment once to number of letters. That way it's easier for us to determine that we haven't forgotten to make that assignment. And because each of our cases, or our case blocks, must return a value or throw an exception when we're using a switch expression, we know that the compiler can make that check for us and register an error if we've made a mistake. We'll also notice that the number of lines of code is significantly shorter. And that's because now the developers of this particular feature looked around and they found this, this little known feature. It's called a comma separated list. So now, rather than having to have a case on separate lines, each one for each day, we can do case Monday, comma, Friday, comma, Sunday. It, it's hard to believe that it took us 27 years to figure that out, but there you go. We've finally done it, and so we've got more concise syntax. The great thing is, though, that it doesn't reduce the readability of the code. We can still see exactly what's going on. Everything works nicely. In terms of the syntax, obviously, we've used the arrow operator, borrowed that from the lambda expression. And the right-hand side of the operator is the value that will be returned or the exception that's going to be thrown. So this is all very good. The important thing about this is that in the case of switch expressions, they must be complete or exhaustive. And we'll come back to why this is important a little bit later on when we talk about the pattern matching
in Switch. The other thing we need to talk about before we get into the pattern matching side of things is algebraic data types in Java. This is something that we do a lot. We create a simple class to encapsulate data that we want to work with. Java is an object-oriented language, so we have this idea of classes, encapsulation, and so on. Here, I've got a simple point class. This has two values, x and y, which are doubles. So to do that, I create a class called point. I then declare two instance fields, being final double x, final double y. I need a constructor to initialize those values, and I need to explicitly have the code to say this dot x equals x, this dot y equals y. Because I've encapsulated those instance fields and made them private, I need to have accessor methods to return the values, so double x and double y. What we have here is 14 lines of code to implement a tuple. And you think to yourself, well, you know, Java has something like 4,500 classes. Why have we never added the tuple class to Java? And I actually asked Brian Gertz about this, and I said, why don't we have a tuple class? He said, well, yes, we could add a tuple class, but then you'd want a triple class, and you'd want a quadruple class, and where do we stop? What they did was they came up with a better solution, and that's called records. So now we have a simplified way of creating an encapsulated set of variables where we don't really need additional code. What we can do is we can say record point, and then we have a record declaration. We use the same syntax that we have for the constructor, and we simply say, what are the things that we want to put in that record? In this case, double X, double Y. Now, a record is just a form of class, which is a slightly special form of class. In the same way that an enumeration is a slightly special form of class, a record is. So we have braces, but because we're not doing anything other than just encapsulating these two values, we don't need to have any additional code. We can reduce our 14 lines of code that we had on the previous slide into one line of code. So this is very good. Records are quite flexible. So if you want to, you can make them generic. They're just like normal classes. So you can say, have a record called anything, with the generic type parameter t, and then store objects of type t in there. If you want to, you can add more functionality. Here we've got a record called circle, which encapsulates a single value radius. You can add static fields to a record. You can't add any instance fields which are not declared in the record declaration, but you can add static instance fields. So we can have pi 3.142. We can add some additional behavior in the form of a method area, which is going to return a double. Great. The other thing that we need to look at is a change that was made in terms of how inheritance works in Java. Again, object-oriented programming language, we have the concept of inheritance where we can declare a superclass, in this case shape, and we can have three subclasses, triangle, square, and pentagon. That's all good, but we don't have any real control over who can extend a given class. It's a binary type of thing, it's all or nothing, because we either say that shape can be extended, and therefore anyone can use it as a superclass, or we can make it final in which case nobody can extend it. In JDK 15, we introduced the idea of sealed classes. What this allows us to do is to give a constrained set of classes that can subclass the class shape in this case. To do that, we introduced some new keywords, and we said we now have a modifier on class called sealed. So we can say public sealed class shape, and we'll add a permit clause, which will define all of the classes which are allowed to use shape as a superclass and therefore a subclass it. In this case, triangle, square, and pentagon. Now, if we were to try and come along and say, right, I like the shape class, I want to create a new subclass and say, let's create a circle, that now won't work. The compiler will reject that and it will say class is not allowed, shape, is not listed in its permits clause. 
So this gives us the ability to define a type hierarchy in a much more constrained way. A couple of other things about um, SEAL classes inheritance. All of these um, subclasses must explicitly state their inheritance capabilities. Three ways of doing that. First is that we can say, in the case of triangle, that we want to have a sealed class, so it's extending the idea of it being sealed. We're going to have triangle, and we're going to permit further subclasses, equilateral and isosceles. The second thing we could do is we could make that class final. In case of square, we simply say public final class square, and that way nobody can then further extend square. And the last thing that we can do is effectively turn off the ceiling of that class and make it accessible to anybody in terms of subclassing. And to do that, we use this new modifier non-sealed. Now, this in itself is, is kind of an interesting thing because there was a lot of discussion about whether Java should have hyphenated keywords, non-sealed. And the ultimate decision was that if we want to be able to extend the language a lot further, the idea of having hyphenated keywords is actually quite important. But when they introduced this, obviously they need to be quite careful. So this is what's known as a contextual keyword. It's only a keyword when it's in a particular place in your code. Doesn't, it's not a reserved word in the same way that class and public and private and so on are reserved words. In this case, it is a contextual keyword. The reason for that, as I thought about, is that you could have two variables. You could have int non equals four, int sealed equals two, and then you could say sealed equals non hyphen sealed, which in this case actually means that you're subtracting sealed from non, but if you don't have that as a contextual keyword, the compiler will get very confused. So we, we do it this way. Right, so let's get into the pattern matching part of Java. First thing, let's look at the instance of operator. Once again, Java is an object-oriented programming language, which means one of the fundamental things is polymorphism. We can view an object as any of the types that it actually represents. Now, that means the concrete type that it actually is, plus any of the superclasses of that type, plus any of the interfaces that it implements or any of its supertypes implement. In order for us to determine whether a reference is of a specific type, we use instance of. Again, we've all done this. We know what the basic idea of this is. But if we look at this, this is a, the way that we end up using it. We say, if obj instance of string, then we obviously want to do something with it. But we're restricted in that we can't simply refer to object as a string. We actually have to put in an explicit declaration of a new variable of type string, and then we have to do a cast from obj to type string. And this is one of those things that, you know, as a, a Java programmer, you kind of look at it and you think, why do we do that? And, and there's never been a really good explanation to me about why we couldn't simply say, if object, obj, is an instance of string, within the true branch of that if statement, the compiler knows that we must have passed that test, therefore obj can be referred to as a string. So why don't we just use it as a string? And it will work quite happily. And so we just, you know, that hasn't worked in that way. So what we now do is we've introduced the idea of pattern matching for instance of. This came in in JDK 14. So again, going back to what we talked about at the beginning, the idea that we have a match predicate and a pattern variable. In this case, the match predicate is going to be obj instance of string. So that equates to a boolean. It's either true or false. That's our predicate. If we have an instance of string, then the pattern variable s is conditionally extracted. So s then represents the string that we have as obj. Again, it's, it's one of those things where you think, why do we need a second variable? Why can't we just refer to obj as a string? But this, we're doing it this way because it makes it uh, sort of easier in terms of the overall implementation of pattern matching in the language. 
So if we do have a reference to a type string, then we can call s.length, s is valid in terms of its scope, and we can use it quite happily. In the false branch of that test, since we don't have a reference to a string, the scope of s is not valid, so we couldn't use s and do something with it. Now, we can be a little bit more sophisticated in how we use that. We can say if obj instance of string s and s.length is greater than zero. We know, as Java programmers, that the way that the AND operator works is that we always evaluate the left-hand side of the operator. And only if that equates to true do we evaluate the right-hand side. That's good, because it means that if we evaluate true on the left, we know we have a string. Therefore, s has been extracted, it has scope, and we can use it on the right-hand side of the AND operator to test if the length is greater than zero. However, what we can't do is do an OR, because again, we know that if we use the OR operator, we always evaluate the left-hand side of the operator, and only if that equates to false do we evaluate the right-hand side. So in that case, if it evaluates to false, we don't have a string, so the scope of S as a variable is now invalid, and we couldn't call length on it, and the compiler will give us an error. We need to be quite careful about how the scoping of our pattern variables works, because we can invert the test. So here I could say, if not O instance of string, and then assign a pattern variable S to that, and if it's not an instance string, return from that method. What that means is that the effective true branch of that if statement is the rest of the method. So the scope of S is valid for the rest of that method, whether it's hundreds of lines of code or two lines of code. Which brings us to the idea of what's called flow scoping. The scoping of pattern variables is different to the scoping of local variables. If you look at local variables, the definition is that the, the scoping is valid from wherever the variable is declared to the end of the block in which it's declared. Now, whether that's a block of code, a method, a for loop, a while loop, or whatever. But that's where the scope is valid. The other thing that we know about local variables is that they are subject to definite assignment. You must assign a value. There isn't a default value like there is for instance fields. And the compiler will reject code if you haven't made an assignment. So when we look at binding variables in terms of patterns, what we find is that the, the definition of the, the scope of that variable is all the places where it would have definite assignment, all the places where it will have a value. And if we look at those examples previously, where we have the inverted test, we know that it will have definite assignment for the rest of that method. So that is the, the, the scope of that, flow scoping. It's not the same as local variables. That's good because it allows us to do things like this. We can say if O instance of integer, and then use a pattern variable num. And then we can also do else if O instance of float and reuse that variable as a pattern variable num. And again, instance of long reuse num. We couldn't do that with local variables because the compiler will complain. But with local variables, because we have, sorry, with pattern variables, because we have flow scoping, the scope of those variables is only where they're subject to definite assignment, so it's only the true part of each of those conditionals. Which brings us to a little bit of a puzzle. So, let's say I have this very simple piece of code here. I create a reference to an object, and I'll call it s. So object s equals new object. And then I'll do if s instance of string s, print out the length of the string, otherwise print out no string. So let's have a show of hands here. Who thinks this code will compile? Oh, I, I see one person, two people, very few people. Okay, few people think it will compile. Who thinks it will not compile? Okay, more people. There's a lot of people who haven't put their hands up. So who thinks it will both compile and not compile at the same time? <laughs> because that is the answer. <laughs> now, you think to yourself, hang on, how can that be? How can we have quantum superposition in a compiler? 
that doesn't work. You can't have two states at the same time. I'm being a bit facetious here, but what actually happens is if you were to type that into your IDE as a part of a, a method and compile it, the compiler will rightly reject it because S, in the case of the pattern variable, has already been used as the local variable S for the object. So you can't reuse it. So how can we actually compile this? Well, if you use JShell, it will work. And I, I literally, I tested it this morning on JDK 22. I haven't tested it on JDK 23 yet, but on JDK 22, this still works. You can do object test equals new object. And I literally cut and pasted from JShell onto the slide, and it says, yep, you haven't got a string. I have no idea why this works. And I've asked lots of people. I've, I've, I've asked people at Oracle, and they look and they go, that's a bug. <laughs> and, and yet, nobody's fixed it yet. So, interesting thing about pattern matching there. OK, next thing. Pattern matching for switch. We looked at the switch statement and the switch expression earlier on. So, when we use switch, we used to have a limited set of things that we could switch on. Literally, we could switch on integral values, so numbers. We could switch on strings and we could switch on enumerations. What we've now done is to extend that to allow type patterns to be used. So we can switch on a type rather than a value. And we can end up with something like this. So we create a method called type tester, pass in an object reference, and then we can have switch on O in certain cases for different types. First one, interestingly, is that we can have a case for null. Now, this is good because in the past, if we were doing something like strings, we would have to put an external test outside of the switch to see if we had a null value. Otherwise, the, the switch would throw a null pointer exception. So now we can explicitly put a case in our switch for null. And we can print out a message saying we've got a null type. In this case, because null is null is null, there is no pattern variable because there's nothing that, that will change. So we just refer to it as null. But for types, we can have case string and have a pattern variable s. So our pattern predicate is the fact that we're matching on the type string, and then the pattern variable is s associated with that. On the right-hand side of the arrow operator, because we know that we have definite assignment, we can refer to s as the string, and we can print out this value. Same thing if we have color, we can then call the get RGB method on that because we have a reference that we can call through to that. Now, primitive types, and I'll come back to this at the end, primitive types up till now have not been allowed in this particular scenario because a primitive is not a true type in the case of the Java language. It, it doesn't represent a true type. But an array of primitives is a proper type. So we can have a case for int square brackets to indicate it's an array, and then we can refer to that on the right-hand side and print out the length of the array. And then we can obviously have our default as well. A little bit more about null, because null is a little bit special in this. So we can have the case of null, and that gets used for all cases, sorry, all situations, I should say, to avoid confusion, all situations where we're using pattern matching for switch. And what we've done here is to ensure backwards compatibility, essentially the compiler will insert one for you if you don't put one in there. Let's look at an example. So we do a switch on O and we've got our case string, case color, case int array, but we don't have a situation that deals with null. Essentially what the compiler is going to do is insert a case null for us, which will throw a null pointer exception. This guarantees that we have backwards compatibility with existing code, because again, if we were using strings, then they will behave in exactly the same way if you don't have a case for null. You can also, because we can use these magical comma-separated lists, you can have null and default handled in the same way. And again, that's quite nice because it allows you to say, well, you know, if I've got these three types, I want to do this particular thing. If I've got a null or something else, I want to handle it in one particular way. So it allows us to do that in one line of code. 
So coming back to completeness, and I mentioned this when we were talking about switch expressions earlier on, what we say here is that we have to deal with all possible values. So let's look at this piece of code here where we do a switch on O and we only have two cases. We've got one for string and one for integer. And the question is, if we pass in something that isn't a string or an integer, what happens? If I pass in a float, what would you do? And you could argue that because there isn't a case for float, you simply ignore it. If you treat the switch as a sort of if-then-else kind of a simplified construct, you could say, well, OK, there isn't a case for float, so we'll simply ignore it and move on to whatever code is below that. But the decision was made that that would be very easy for people to introduce errors that you know, were hard to find. So to make the code more reliable, we have to deal with every single possible type that can be passed to this switch statement or switch expression. Now, in order to do that, obviously, we can list out all the possible types. But in this case, it's going to be an infinite number of types. We solve that easily by adding a default. So if we've got a string or an integer, we do these things. Anything else, we will do print out some other type. And that means that we now have coverage of all possible types in the things that are being passed there. Now, that doesn't mean you have to have a default in every possible switch. Because if we go back to our idea of sealed classes that we looked at earlier on and use that same example where we've got a shape with three subtypes, triangle, square, and pentagon, that is a type hierarchy that is sealed. So there are only four possible types that you can use there. And that way we can have a shape tester or type tester on shape, do a switch on shape, and have a case for triangle, case for square, case for pentagon, case for shape. That covers every single eventuality in terms of type. We don't need a default to make that work. The other thing we can do is we can use what's called a guarded pattern. And this again comes back to what we looked at in terms of the instance of operator, where we said that we could have an and operator to say if we have an instance of a particular type and some value is associated with that. Now, initially, when they designed this, they, they said, let's use the AND operator. So you'd have case triangle T and T dot area greater than 25. Then in JDK 19, the designers decided that they would modify that a little bit and use the new contextual keyword, when, to indicate that that was going to be the guarded pattern. So when T dot area is greater than 25. So it effectively is the same as an AND statement. Great. Now things get interesting. Right, where when is, is important. Because again, it's a contextual keyword. And I thought, let's have some fun with this. Let's see how far we can push the compiler with this. So we'll introduce a new abstract class called interrogator. And it's going to have, it's a sealed class which is going to have some subtypes which are who, what, where, when, and why. Then we're going to have a class called when, which extends interrogator, and it's going to have a method called when. Now what we can do is we can create our test question, which takes an interrogator, and then we'll switch on question. And we need a set of cases to ensure that we have completeness. We are exhaustive. We'll also have a couple of extra methods that we'll just add here. So we'll have a Boolean called where and a void called why. And that way we can say we can have what, case what, what. So the pattern variable is what. And then we'll print out what. Same for where, pattern variable where. Same for why, pattern variable why. And then obviously a default, which technically we don't need because it's a sealed class, but uh, we'll put it in there anyway. And then we can go, OK, let's have case who, what, when, where, why. OK, you can see where I'm going with this, can't you? And then the last one that we have to add is obviously a case for when. Case when, 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 when. Now, it's interesting here, see, because when you look at that, you think, oh, that's going to be really tough for the compiler. Because you, you actually have to figure out, OK, well, when with a capital W is the type, so that's all right. And then the pattern variable is called when. And then we've got the contextual keyword to indicate that we've got a guarded pattern. That's the third when, technically. 
And then you've got the guard on that, which is what we're going to evaluate in terms of bind, uh, Boolean. So we'll call the when method on the pattern variable called when, and then because we've got a local method called when, we'll then call that if we have something that is both a when object and the when.when .when method returns true. So I, I don't recommend writing code like this. Pattern dominance is also very important. So what do I mean by that? Well, we have to think about, we could reorder the cases that we have in our sealed type. And we could say, let's have case shape at the beginning. Now, the problem with that is that shape is the superclass of triangle, square, and pentagon. So all of those objects that are a triangle or a square or a pentagon are going to also be of type shape, polymorphism. So that would, would not work because everything would match on shape, which means that the cases for triangle, square, and pentagon would be inaccessible. So unreachable code, the compiler will reject it. The other thing with pattern dominance is that you also need to be careful when you use a guard, because if you put case triangle T on its own before you do the guarded pattern, clearly anything that is a triangle is going to match against that first, and you'll never get to the guarded pattern where you're going to test to see if the area is greater than 25. So again, the compiler will reject that. And you also need to be careful that, you know, if you are using a guarded pattern, that if you have something that always returns true, um, you know, the compiler might be able to test this, but you, you need to be careful about how you use that because it would then dominate the pattern underneath. So the, the definition actually says it's a compile time error for a label in a switch block to be norm dominated by an earlier label in that switch block. So you just need to be careful about the order that you put them in there. Pattern matching instance of and records. Okay, so we can pattern match on a record because a record is a type. Remember, it's just a special form of class. So we could do use our record point where we've got double X and double Y. And then we could say if O instance of point P, and then we need to get the values out of that. So we want X and Y. So we can say double X equals P dot X, double Y equals P dot Y. Use those in calculating the hypotenuse of a triangle. But we can do better than that. So this is where what's called record patterns come in. Record patterns introduced in JDK 19 are an example of that type of pattern that we talked about earlier, which is a deconstruction pattern. So in addition to assigning a pattern variable, we can also extract things from the variable at the same time. Now, it only works with records, so you can't use it with classes and try and call methods on uh, the instance fields of that. So what we can now do is we can say, rather than having if O instance of point and use a pattern variable P, and then using that to explicitly call the, the methods to access the variables, what we do is put the record declaration into the pattern matching. So our match predicate now becomes O instance of point double X double Y. One interesting point about this is that you don't have to use the same variable names for the record declaration that you might have used where you declared it initially. As long as you have the right signature in terms of the name of the record and the types of the and the order of the, the variables that are declared in that, it will work quite happily. You don't have to have X and Y used explicitly. You could use other variable names. That way, we don't have to then call the methods to ex access those variables explicitly. We can just use that within our calculations, simplify things. Now, patterns are composable. Let's, again, take some example code here. We'll create an interface called rectangle. We'll create our record point, double X, double Y. We'll also include an enumeration for color, red, green, and blue. And then we're gonna create two new records first one's going to be called a color point, which is going to have a point and a color. And then we'll have a color rectangle that's going to have a color point for the top left, color point for the bottom right, and it's going to implement our rectangle interface. Great. So now what we could do is we could say print color of rectangle R. So we'll pass in a rectangle reference, and we'll say if R instance of color rectangle, and then we'll say color point top left, color point bottom right, 
which is matching against our color rectangle um, pattern declaration. And then we'll print out top left dot C. But obviously, top left is a record itself. So we can go one step further. And we can say, if our instance of color rectangle, and then have color point and give the record declaration of that. So we've got point P, color C, and then we can just point, print out C without having to do that reference through the, the variable that we have. And you can see I've changed the name of the second color point to BR to make it simpler. But we know that point is also yet another record. So we can go one step further and we could say, print the top left X value. And if our instance of color rectangle, and we know we've got a color point, a point consists of a color point consists of a point with a double X and a double Y, color C, color point BR. And then we just print out X. Now at this point, you're probably thinking, well, that's all good, but I'm really not seeing how this makes my code more readable and easier to develop and things like that. It's just getting more and more unwieldy and complicated. Yes. So how can we improve on that? Well, we can use local variable type inference. So we can use what was introduced in JDK 10 and use the var keyword. So now we could simplify our thing and simply say, let the compiler figure out for us what these types are. So we don't have to have a lot of data detail there. So now we've got color point, point, var x, var y, var c, var br. Right. But we can take that one step further as well. So one of the more recent introductions was the idea of unnamed pattern variables, JEP443. I think that came in in JDK20, it might have been. What this says is that we know that there are variables that are going to be in our pattern, but we don't care what they are. And this goes back to that any pattern that we were talking about right at the very beginning. So it, it allows us to make things more readable by using the single underscore character. And if you go back to JDK9, you will find that the single underscore used to be valid as a variable name. Of course, nobody would ever use un single underscore as a variable name. And then it became a reserved word. For those of you who really did want to still use a single underscore as a variable name, two or more underscore still works quite happily. So what you can now do is simplify your code by saying, OK, we know that the color point or it's, we know that color rectangle consists of two color points, but we don't care what the second one is. So let's replace that with an underscore to indicate that there is something there, but we just don't need to worry about what it is, what its type is, what its variable name is, or anything like that. Similarly, with the color point, we know that we have a color involved, but we don't care about it, so we'll replace it with a single underscore. And in the case of our point, we don't care about what the Y value is, so we'll replace that with a single underscore. And that does make our code a lot more simple. You know, it's easier to see what's going on, even though we're using quite a complex um, composed pattern. So we've got no interest in those, so let's ignore them. The other thing you could use unnamed pattern variables for is in switch. So if, for example, you, or you're testing against types and you don't want to use the variable on the right-hand side, because all you're going to do is print out some detail, then you could use the single underscore and say case string underscore case color underscore and so on. That's probably less of an important thing because um, obviously you know you could use a single letter variable for that. It didn't really matter, but there you go. Primitive types in patterns. So going back to when we were talking about uh, the switch expression, I said that you could have an int array, but you couldn't have an int on its own because int being a primitive wasn't a true type in the case of Java. So what we've now done is extend both instance of and switch to handle primitives. What that allows us to do is something like this. So we can have byte x equals 128. And then we can say, if x instance of int, then we can have an int. Now that will work because remember that a byte can be treated as an int because a byte will fit into an int. So you get a few things where, because of the promotion of the primitives, it may not necessarily be immediately obvious that if x is an instance of int, even though it's a byte, that will still match. You can also have the idea of x instance of int with a pattern variable. So x instance of int i, and then you can treat that as an int. 
not really sure what the benefit of that is because you can try treat a byte as a an int. I'm sure there's probably some situations where that does make sense, but in this particular example, it's probably not really much that um, benefit to introducing a pattern variable rather than referencing x directly. And similarly with the switch, you can change that. So now we can have float value and get that from somewhere, and we can say float new value equals, so we use this switch expression, and we'll say switch on the value, case 0f, so if the case we've got a, a 0, then we'll return 5 as a float. In the case where we have a float which is going to be called x, and we'll use a guarded pattern, so when x equals 1 float, uh, then we'll return 6f plus x, so we're using the pattern variable on the right-hand side, so it makes sense to have that. And we'll then have a float x on its own and return 7f plus x. Now, the reason for having case float x on its own is remember that all of our switches now have to be exhaustive, so we have to deal with every possible value. So case float x on its own will deal with anything where we don't have a 0 or a 1f. There are some quite detailed, if you look at the, the JEP, there are some quite detailed rules regarding how the exhaustiveness of these primitives work. So there's, there's quite a lot of detail to it, and you need to read it carefully to understand all the sort of edge cases that are associated with that. So to summarize then, um, pattern matching is a very powerful feature. I think that if you look at what we've gone through in all the different aspects of pattern matching that's been added to the Java language. It's a great way of simplifying a lot of code and enabling us to catch errors more at compile time rather than waiting to run time to figure out what's going wrong. So it's very good in that sense. It's much more declarative in terms of the approach that we're using. Interestingly, there's also some potential for optimizations at the compiler level. Once we use this pattern matching, um, there's the ability to say, okay, let's generate some more heavily optimized code from that underneath so we can get better performance by using pattern matching rather than it just being a sort of syntactic sugar to simplify our code. Lots of features have already been added. Um, there's definitely more to come. Like I said, JDK23 is introducing this idea of primitives into the instance of and switch. And I would expect there will be some other features that will be added later as well. So that's it. I think I've actually got two and a half minutes. If anybody's got any questions, I can, I can try and answer. Thank those. you. Thank you.